Chapter Sixteen of Comic History of England, recorded in honour of Jim Mowat's completion of his university degree. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Comic History of England by Bill Nye. Chapter Sixteen: Unpleasant Caprices of Royalty. Introduction of Printing as a Subsidiary Aid in the Progress of Emancipation Henry the Sixth left no royal record worth remembering, save the establishment of Eton and King's Colleges. Edward the Fourth, who began his reign in 1461, was bold and active. Queen Margaret's army of sixty thousand men, which attacked him, was defeated, and half her forces slaughtered, no quarter being given. His title was now confirmed, and Margaret fled to Scotland. Three years later she attempted again to secure the throne, through the aid of Louis XI, but failed. Henry, who had been in concealment, was now confined in the tower, as shown in the engraving on the following page. Edward's marriage was not satisfactory, and, as he bestowed all the offices on his wife's relatives, Warwick deserted him, and espoused the cause of Queen Margaret. He had no trouble in raising an army and compelling Edward to flee. Henry was taken from the tower and crowned, his rights having been recognised by Parliament. Warwick and his son-in-law, the Duke of Clarence, brother to Edward IV, were made regents, therefore, in 1471. Before the year was out, however, the tables were again turned, and Henry found himself once more in his old quarters in the tower. Warwick was soon defeated and slain and on the same day Margaret and her son Edward landed in England. She and Edward were defeated and taken prisoners at Tewkesbury, and the young prince cruelly put to death by the dukes of Clarence and Gloucester, brothers of Edward the Fourth. Margaret was placed in the tower, and a day or two after Henry died mysteriously there, it is presumed at the hands of Gloucester, who was socially an unpleasant man to meet after dark. Margaret died in France in 1482, and the Lancastrians gave up all hope. Edward, feeling again secure, at the instigation of his younger brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester, caused Clarence, the other brother, to be put to death, and then began to give his entire attention to vice, never allowing his reign to get into his rum, or interfere with it. He was a very handsome man, but died, in 1483, of what the historian calls a distemper. Some say he died of heart failure while sleeping off an attack of coma. Anyway, he turned up his comatose, as one might say, and passed on from a spiritous life to a spiritual one, such as it may be. He was a counterfeit sovereign. In 1474 the first book was printed in England, and more attention was then paid to spelling. William Caxton printed this book, a work on chess. The form of the types came from Germany and was used until James I introduced the Roman type. James I took a great interest in plain and ornamental job printing, and while trying to pick a calling card out of the jaws of a crude job press in the early years of his reign, contributed a royal thumb to this restless emblem of progress and civilization. The War of the Roses having destroyed the nobility, times greatly improved, and industry was declared constitutional. Edward V, at twelve years of age, became king, and his uncle Dick, Duke of Gloucester, became protector. As such he was a disgrace, for he protected nobody but himself. The young king and his brother, the Duke of York, were placed in the tower, and their uncle, Lord Hastings, and several other offensive partisans, on the charge of treason, were executed in 1483. He then made arrangements that he should be urged to accept the throne and with a coy and reluctant grace, peculiar to this gifted assassin, he caused himself to be proclaimed Richard the Third. Richard then caused the young princes to be smothered in their beds, in what is now called the Bloody Tower. The Duke of Buckingham was at first loaded with honours in return for his gory assistance, but even he became disgusted with the wicked usurper, and headed a Welsh rebellion. He was not successful, and in 1483 he received a slight testimonial from the king, as portrayed by the gifted artist of this work. 
the surprise and sorrow shown on the face of the duke, together with his thrift and economy in keeping his cigar from being spattered, and his determination that, although he might be put out, the cigar should not be, prove him to be a man of great force of character for a duke. Richard now espoused his niece, daughter of Edward the Fourth, and, in order to make the home-nest perfectly free from social erosion, he caused his consort, Anne, to be poisoned. Those who believed the climate around the throne to be bracing and healthful had a chance to change their views in a land where pea-soup fog can never enter. Anne was the widow of Edward, whom Richard slew at Tewkesbury. Everyone felt that Richard was a disgrace to the country, and Henry, Earl of Richmond, succeeded in defeating and slaying the usurper on Bosworth Field, in 1485, when Henry was crowned on the battlefield. Richard was buried at Leicester, but, during the reign of Henry the Eighth, when the monasteries were destroyed, Richard's body was exhumed, and his stone coffin used for many years in that town as a horse-trough. Shakespeare and the historians gave an unpleasant impression regarding Richard's personality, but this was done in the interest of the Tudors, perhaps. He was highly intelligent, and, if he had given less attention to the usurpation, would have been more popular. Under the administrations of the houses of Lancaster and York, serfdom was abolished, as the slaves who were armed during the War of the Roses would not submit again to slavery after they had fought for their country. Agriculture suffered, and some of the poor had to subsist upon acorns and wild roots. During those days Whittington was thrice Lord Mayor of London, though at first only a poor boy. Even in the land of lineage this poor lad, with a cat, and no other means of subsistence, won his way to fame and fortune. The manufacture of wool encouraged the growing of sheep. <laughs> That's what it says. And in 1455 silk began to attract attention. During his reign Richard had known what it was to need money, and the rich merchants and pawnbrokers were familiar with his countenance when he came after office hours to negotiate a small loan. Science spent a great deal of surplus energy experimenting on alchemy, and the philosopher's stone, as well as the elixir of life, attracted much attention. But, as neither of these commodities are now on the market, it is presumed that they were never successful. Printing may be regarded as the most valuable discovery during those bloody years, showing that peace hath her victories no less than war, and from this art came the most powerful and implacable enemy to ignorance, and its attendant crimes that progress can call its own. No two authors spelled alike in that time, however, and the literature of the day was characterised by the most startling originality along that line. The drama began to bud, and the chief roles were taken by the clergy. They acted Bible scenes interspersed with local witticisms, and often turned away money. Afterwards followed what were called moral plays, in which the bad men always suffered intensely on a small salary. The feudal castles disappeared, and new and more airy architecture succeeded them. A better class of furniture also followed, but it was vainly scattered through the rooms, and a person, on rising from his bed in the night, would have some difficulty in falling over anything. Tidies on the chairs were unknown, and there were only tapestry enough to get along with in a sort of hand-to-mouth way. End of chapter 16